talking about financial planning and even after uh, you purchase a property. Um, Interest rates. 
Now, if you're an investor, what's on stake for you? There's a lot of new stock coming to the market. Why? Because the government put up so much incentives for people to build, to bring more stock in. Then you have all these new opportunities on places where we reserve. So areas in Sydney, in Brisbane, in Victoria, all these areas that were not supposed to be for people to live in, and now they are. And because of the low interest rates and because of all these activities, they are very good returns. So you can actually, most of the properties, uh, depending on the, of the price you purchase them from, they probably like positively geared from day one. I say that because this is what Australia is all about. Australia loves property. This is the whole property market in whole Australia in the last 20 years. As you can see, whoever is waiting for the property market to drop or the bubble to bust or whatever, here are all the things that were put into place and people said, oh, now the property market will drop. Now the property market will drop. We had the recession. Now the property market 100% will drop. We had GFC. Look what happened after GFC. APRA hitting really with restrictions of lending. And now we're going up again. So whoever thinks they are smart enough to actually know where are we and time it, it's really, really hard. It's almost impossible. So how to make this process easier? You do not need to do this on your own. You don't need to, do, to know everything. It's almost impossible. So my point here is that I want <coughs> you to, why would you need a property strategist? A property strategist will be someone who will come, sit down with you, ask you all those hard questions, find your why, set expectations, and go out there and find that property that fits your expectation, your current numbers, and get the ball rolling. Now, before you even talk to me, what I like to do is like, okay, so a lot of people out there, they think, oh, I have a deposit, therefore, that means I can go house shopping. And this is why I wanna hand it over to John. And John, you tell me, how many people like you that are out there? I'm gonna try to talk extra loud off of being a physical. Whoever talks out to her sounds quite... <laughs> 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 Yeah, like Peter said, uh, I often get people calling up uh, after they've found the property they like and they've never looked at how much they can actually afford. Um, and then they get disappointed because they realize they can't afford the house that they've fallen in love with or visited five times already in the last four weeks. So um, it's really important to find out exactly how much you can afford now. Um, the worst case is when they call up and they've already bought a property and they've signed the property put down the deposit without having and without finding out how much exactly they can borrow. So, um, exactly as Pam said, what you need to know beforehand is, uh, firstly, what's your contribution towards the purchase? Now, that includes your general savings, of course, as well as um, any liquid assets that you'll be putting towards the purchase. We're seeing a lot of shares at the moment, um, as well as cryptocurrencies. And then, genuine, uh, and then gifts from your family members as well, uh, whether that's coming from overseas or internally as well. And then um, determining how much you can borrow. So I often get asked the question, this is my income, this is my living expense, how much can I borrow to? But there's so many other factors that go into it, including what other liabilities you have, how many children you have, as well as which lender we're going to as well. So between different lenders, I've seen it vary as much as $100,000. Mm -hmm. And then, finding out what the expected costs are. So there's various different costs involved, and when you actually take that out from the deposit, people often realize that they don't actually have, uh, they can't actually afford uh, the, the amount they thought. So, and then you determine what the maximum purchase price is, and then you go house hunting. So to determine what the costs are, firstly, the stamp duty, now, um, there's a lot of government concessions going on at the moment for uh, first-time buyers. So whether you're buying an established property or a vacant land, 
for a newly built that they've got different schemes running. So you'd have to pull through a, uh, a full setup uh, conveyor like um, Anne or someone like myself who deals with those every day and knows the scheme. And they're changing all the climate at the moment, especially with the COVID uh, happening. The government's come out with new schemes as well. And then lenders mortgage insurance. Now this also varies depending lender to lender because they use, some use QV, some use Genworth uh, for different insurers, some are self-insured as well. So depending on the lender and how much you borrow, uh, the lender's mortgage insurance varies as well. And then you've got bank, bank fees involving application fees, valuation fees, settlement fees, ongoing fees, which are generally in the whole scheme of things, not as big, they're pretty negligible. And then you've got solicitor fees uh, ranging some for, I mean, and how much <laughs> can you expect for a solicitor fee? Uh, generally 1,200 plus GC, but you've got disbursements as well, which is like the property certificates that you purchase on behalf of your client to clear out any council rates, so do it for me, I like to keep it safe, so I always tell the customer to keep aside at least $3,000 for the convincing fee as well as all the minor costs. Uh, and then something like building, uh, if you're buying a house, building a desk, so you do someone like um, Terry. Or oh, Mahmoud. Yeah. <laughs> but, but Terry, how much um, would a building a desk with all the cost on that? It varies uh, house to house, uh, but approximately $500 give or take. And then if you're buying a apartment, you want to do a strata report to make sure that in the committee meetings, uh, there's no significant issues that's being discussed. Um, there has been incidents where I've had customers that put a deposit down on a property and then they do the strata report and find out that there's major plumbing issues or structural issues that's popping up. And that, um, that was going to come up with special levies in the thousands, if not tens of thousands in the future. Customers have pulled out from purchase. And sometimes um, the owners aren't as upfront as they should be about it, so it's important to do your due diligence. Then depreciation for, I think you do depreciation reports as well. Right? Yes, correct. Yeah, how much uh, roughly would you use? Approximately $700. Yeah. So if you're getting an investment property, it's always recommended to do a depreciation report because generally over a period of five to ten years, you're definitely going to save money. So we'll go through a quick example of how that would work. Now, in this scenario, let's say you've got $85,000 and you're looking for a purchase price of uh, $850,000. A lot of people will come and say, John, I've got 10%, I just need 90% uh, borrowing. So, as you can see, um, you actually don't have 10% to put towards the purchase because 10,000 would go towards state charges and fees, which is stamp duty and costs. Lenders mortgage insurance of $24,000. And then you actually need eight hundred and eighty-five thousand uh, dollars, which is ends up being a borrowing of eight hundred and five thousand dollars, which is a minus five percent borrowing. And then you'd have a surplus of about five thousand dollars, which is sort of covers all the adult costs. So what's the process? Um, you can go direct to a bank and then talk to a branch who's going to sell you their product, or you can talk to a mortgage broker like myself and have the initial conversation, um, understand what your financial position is, what you're trying to do, and then gather all the documents, mortgage broker will go back, do all, all this research and come back with a recommendation, and then you put a submission through, uh, get pre proof and then you know exactly how much you can afford and go to property home. Once you've found the property, you get the valuation done through the bank, and make sure it comes in on purchase price, and then you turn the pre-approval into a formal approval, which is called also a uh, unconditional approval, and then a um, and then the bank issues a loan contract, and you'll be ready for settlement on the settlement day, which is generally six weeks after the purchase date. Um, you become the owner of the property. So how do I help? Basically everything I said there, but um, I hold the customer's hand end to end and make sure that everything goes through. Cool. Now you purchase the property. That's great. You're happy. But what are other things that you need to know? Should you insure yourself? Should you cover, like, so Paul will actually touch base very quickly of all the next steps that you need to put in place after you purchase it. Thanks, Maynard. It's a very, very quickly. We've got, what, two minutes left? Yeah. Okay, so, um, basically, when we discuss this, there was a question whether I'll go first or come last, right? Because a lot of times before you buy the property and before you see John, you need to actually see if it fits in with your goals, can you afford it long term, 
Well, it has other effects. So that's the sort of stuff that we look at before the property purchase agreement gets talked about. But as John said, sometimes people just go to an auction, put down a deposit, and then think, oh, what the heck am I going to do with the other stuff? So there's also um, other things that need to be planned. Right? Now, personal insurance is right. Now, everyone hates talking about that, and I get that. But if you've just spent a million dollars and got a loan, right, what happens if the main wage earner actually passes away, gets injured, or just can't work, right? So if you don't have life insurance and they pass away, then you've got a new property that no one can afford, which means you've got to sell the property. Normally it's nowhere near the price you could normally get because it's a quick sale. You have to move house, the kids have to change school, you have to move away from all your friends. Right? It's just an absolute disaster. So that's why out of all the insurances, I personally think life insurance is the most important. Because when you lose a partner, there's enough drama in your life and enough disappointment without having to actually change a whole lot of your life. Okay, the total permanent disability just means that you get injured and you can't work in a way that's not covered by income protection. Sometimes you get a lump sum to cover, again, changing the house, paying off mortgage for a couple of years, all that sort of thing. Uh, trauma. That's just if you get a major illness. Now, 90% of trauma is either a stroke, heart attack, or cancer. Now, this is insurance to pay for if you're off work. Sometimes, for instance, cancer is a good example. Our public health system is very good, but if you've got a cancer and they say, look, you can get a treatment for free, but you've got to wait for six months, if you've got trauma insurance, you can go to the private hospital and get booked in next week. Personally, I think that's very important. So, that one there is pretty important. And income protection, basically, if you have that car accident where Here's Ellie Paul, for example, he's a plumber. Now, if he badly damages his legs or his arms, he can't work. So what this does, it gives you 75% of your wage until you're 65. Which again, if you're just taking out a big loan, that's really important. A lot of peace of mind in this for your own family. Okay, so how much do they cover Yes, okay. Yeah, it's a little bit of a Okay, so we've already spoken as well about why protecting your assets is important because if you can't protect them, normally when you sell them, you don't get even near the value of and 10 or 20 years worth of hard work can just go down the drain. Now, this is just a little bit at the end to show what else we do for financial planning, it's not so much for properties. This is a client of mine that came to us about a month ago. Now, he'd done pretty well, or as a couple, they'd done pretty well. And when they retired, they were going to get about $8 million at the age of 60 which is obviously very good. We put some plans together for them and now we've got that up to about a quarter million. So that's a huge difference because even though they had good money, they wanted to do it for their kids and their grandkids. So by doing this, we've actually done it in a way that we've set their family up for generations. And this is another thing we do very quickly. When someone comes to me and says, I want to retire, this particular person won 100,000 a year. We looked at their situation, did a plan for the next five years and we worked out that and under our plan, they can have one for 23 years, which when you're 65, is probably okay. What this doesn't take into account is you can do pensions and stuff like that. So this is the sort of thing you can do with financial planning. Again, you can plan ahead and get good assurance about where you're going. Thank you, guys. So just to sum up, this is what property strategy is. It's not me coming to you and telling you, shoving down a property down your throat because I think that that's the right thing for you. I've worked with other professionals so we together, we can find out what's the best thing for you. So if you know, my best referral is someone at the moment in the market looking to purchase either for themselves or as an investment anywhere in Australia. Thank you. Nice.